Well, we have a pretty interesting character on a call today, and uh, you, you might see that come through in the conversation, but he's someone who's got a high passion for what he does in his career, and that'll come out in this too. But he had a question about, his name's Kevin, he had a question about uh, vertical scrapes, horizontal scrapes. And uh, it might seem like, you know, everyone thinks about mock scrapes during hunting season, but we're looking at mock scrapes and getting our trail cameras it's on. It's a year-round thing. It really yeah. is. And that's what's really cool about it is a lot of people think that it's just, hey, I'm only going to worry about these things during the fall. That's all I run my trail cameras on all year. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's what's really cool about them. Yeah, and we have some cool, probably video too. I think we took video, but pictures too, where um, uh, we were turkey hunting for the first time out here yep. on our Minnesota property. Mm -hmm. And I had a rake in the back of the truck, and I still remember I had my turkey gear on, and yep. we're making a mock scrape. And so, it's <laughs> I like remember we're... somebody asking me, "Why does he need to wear full camo to make a mock scrape?" <laughs> That's true. We were turkey yeah. hunting. This God, we have to be day. official yeah. with the times. We couldn't go change, and <laughs> yeah. but uh, but at the same time too, it's we're out turkey hunting, and it usually spins towards whitetail. At least yep. for me, yep. I know Dylan's more turkey fo focused. I have a really good buddy, uh, Collins Fium from back in Coon Valley. He's huge turkey nut we'll just put it that way but uh i think dylan and colin will be out here hunting a little bit you're planning on hunting out here absolutely you're gonna call me a bird as long right? as you invite me out right yeah that's you know the invitations there like we say you're our oldest so yes. <laughs> but uh let's get uh kevin on the phone and have a little conversation about mock scrapes because i know that when we were probably raking out in may yep and putting a camera on it mm -hmm. And that was some of the first footage we have of actual bucks on the property yeah. and they were just starting to velvet and some of those coke can bases yep. and uh and so we'll get kevin on the phone right now and talk about it and just keep in mind those mock scrapes and and starting those are just around the corner so we do have kevin on the line and kevin i can tell you he's someone that he just doesn't work for a large percentage of the year you know he's really just kevin could you be considered a lazy person or it's just your career what do you do I would say uh, people kind of cross their eyes at me when I tell them that I'm employed um, throughout the hunting season just because uh, my job's a little special in the fact that I get to hit a ball for a living. Um, yeah. So, and it's, um, and you, you yes. worked a little bit longer than you normally do last year. Why? Well, we were fortunate to go through the playoffs and uh, go to the World Series. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. we lost in, in game six, but it was a heck of an experience. So, yeah. That pushed a little bit of uh, early October hunting back, but yeah, and I think it's uh, I think it's something I can sacrifice for for a little bit. Yeah, and getting to know you throughout the last year too, the I can honestly say that I never watched a Tampa Bay Rays game in the past unless they were playing the uh, Tigers, Detroit Tigers. So, <laughs> so this year I became a fan. Uh, my son Sam was a huge fan, and Dante, and we we watched it all the way to the end. So it was pretty cool to follow that and uh yeah. you are anything a, but lazy you're a passionate driven person or you won't be where it wouldn't be where you're at so i see it's crazy i mean how many of the guys do you know that you play with that are actually just bull hunting deer hunting nuts yeah it's a it's a market that um i think a lot of fans don't realize um I've been playing for over a decade now, and every team or organization that I'm with, it, it's amazing how many guys are bow hunters um, and just hunters alone that don't really talk about it. And I don't know if it's because they don't want to get the wrong image or anything like that. But in October, we were, you know, going through all the COVID protocol, and yeah. we were in a little clubhouse, and like they had us all like split up into little pods. And I'm talking to one guy that I know hunts, and this dude out of you know, out of left field, no pun intended. Um, yeah. He's like, "Hey, you guys talking about hunting?" And this, and this is a guy that I didn't even think would know what a white-tailed deer was. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, "Yeah, man, my family has a big farm in Illinois. Check out this buck we're going to try to get after." And it was like, "What?" But yeah. that's been—it's <laughs> crazy the amount of guys that are involved in the sport. And it's—I mean, it's honestly the perfect hobby to be in with with what we do. I mean, we play from. February to um, hopefully through October like we did this year but if not you know you're home October 1st just in time for the majority of opening bow seasons and then yeah. uh, it is cool. we go through the we go through the off season and uh, back at it in February so wow. yeah Dil uh, Dylan's had some uh, you've uh, you filmed for a baseball player uh, last I filmed fall. for Josh Hader the last two falls okay so I've been trying to hook up with Josh I actually talked to him pretty recently <laughs> 
seems like a really good dude. I'm sure Absolutely. that was an excellent experience. With Absolutely. Him. He's a great guy and he loves his deer hunting, which and is. Yeah, you have a good time with him. Yeah, absolutely. Had a blast. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah, like I'm with the with the guy, um, Hunter Strickland. But yeah, so it's just cool. Just every new year, you know, a, a bunch of different guys come in with different backgrounds. I mean, even talking talking with you, uh, Jeff, with like yeah. Zanino, you know, he's in like northern Florida. So me being in oh. like more northern pennsylvania my my system really doesn't apply as much to him but in a weird way it does so sure. it's uh you know like guys from georgia you know you have your out west guys your, your northern california and it's just cool watching them apply everything that you talk about in their uh different demographics so. sure and then in the concepts still apply it's you know oh, big and you can compare it to baseball i mean it doesn't matter if you're going for american league and national league you're still going to approach the plate the same i mean you're you're what you yep. do for a living is the same no matter what field you're on and who you're playing you're gonna you're gonna tailor that to that that person individuals pitching whatever it might be but um, pretty much it's about the same the approach and that's why i look at whitetails and that's why dylan this year Dylan has, uh, and I don't know if I've talked to you about this, Kevin, recently, but Dylan this year, he's got uh, probably 20 people scheduled that he's he's flying into the clients. So he's spending three days with them, and he's finding out. You've already been, what states have you been in already this year? Uh, you have a lot more coming. Yeah, but. Pennsylvania, uh, Oklahoma, North Carolina, and then I I go to at least eight other states from here. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. So got, <laughs> yeah, it fits. Always. Fits everywhere. Yeah. So I always joke with Jeff. So you're so like what you're doing mm. sounds like the dream job to me. But you may look <laughs> at me and say you have the dream job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. No I mean, I, like, it's wild. It's just, oh yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Just That's, to see uh, different perspectives. And what's what's cool about you, Kevin, and talking to you, one of the reasons we started talking is you you have a passion for getting people into the outdoors, whether it's kids or even professional athletes, and <laughs> along with that. And you told me a story, and I'm pretty sure it was you about getting uh, one of the guys you played with in the White Sox. You took him out fishing. You know, like he wanted to go fishing, and in he'd never been fishing or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, if that, what was, if, we actually played in the White Sox together, and then we signed with the Rays last year uh, together. So we were we were living um, at the same spot, and it's funny. He's from Southern California, and he's never really fished. So yeah. I'm out there, you know, showing him how to how to throw a lure and you know he thinks it's just kind of a bobber and a worm type deal and i'm showing <laughs> him how to work a crankbait <laughs> yeah running you know running some bait busters and things like that and you know he was so adamant about catching a fish i mean That's he was awesome. out there more than even me i mean he was like <laughs> like you could see this like internal you know caveman coming out in him right. like i yeah. need to catch a fish mm -hmm. and it took him oh man probably i don't know maybe two weeks he he hooked up with a handful of them and he would lose them right at the dock and it was like heartbreaking because he just wanted to see him get one that's awesome and then he caught one we filleted it showed him how the whole process was and he yeah. and he made a fish sandwich with it and he was like i am like i'm addicted like that's this is awesome. the coolest thing i've ever done in my life that's great and it was just it, it was a really cool experience and i've even taken guys on uh hunts that were just like they didn't even know they had it in them to do stuff like that. And it's yeah. just really cool to see their eyes light up and just open their world to something that maybe their family never exposed them to. Right. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And it kind of goes back to, you know, even that person, you guys that are playing in professional athletes and playing whatever sport, your drive and passion is just, you know, like you introduce him to him, he gets hooked. And then again, no pun intended, but he's, uh, he's out there for two weeks. You know, trying to catch one, <laughs> and, uh, oh, and now you made it. You taught him how to do it, and he's a fisherman for life. And that's kind of the idea. And what we're talking about today with mock scrapes, it's pretty cool because um, what I like about that is you can take someone out hunting, stick them in a blind, and it might be they don't see a deer, and they're freezing the rear off for several days, and they might say, you know, I don't want to do this. But this is something that to me gets a lot of people hooked before the season even begins. They're coming Absolutely. in, and those deer are coming into mock scrapes. And you shared how many pictures with me last year of bucks coming into mock scrapes, and oh, uh, so like, yeah, so like one of my one of my biggest problems was where I hunted almost my whole life was the Pennsylvania State Game Lands, and yeah, you know, I mean, they're so hard to, I mean, they're impossible to pattern for one, but there was just no way to get good pictures of them. I mean, you could guess that's a 
a decent deer trail or a bench that they're going to use. But it was crazy when, um, whenever COVID hit last spring training, I went back and we had about a three month break until we started back up. I went out and placed probably, I don't know, maybe a dozen mock scrapes with cameras on them. And it was like, <laughs> nice. I like, it was like Christmas morning when I got back from the season and I had, I mean, learned a lot of different things about how the deer use them, which species of vine to use, how to set them up, what trees to put them on. And also, you know, you have to consider on public land, you're going to have people look at that thing with cross eyes and either rip it down or steal your camera or things like that. So those are all factors in the public ground, but it was just a really cool learning curve. And I was fortunate enough, um, enough to, um, purchase a piece of land that I'm able, um, to use privately, obviously, but um, just learned a lot of cool things about how deer interact, and probably the biggest one was how curious they are. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I was watching 130-inch 10 points get up on their hind legs and kick around like a little toddler. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. just, it was just really, really cool um, observations of after only doing one, uh, one year with it, so... Well, and it's, you know, what's kind of cool too is that they seem like they're little kids sometimes. They, they seem oh. like it's almost like a toy to them. Right. And now you're, you kind of went into it where, um, you know, you, we talked so many, so much about it, you know, right. um, and you watched all the videos, you've been through the web class, all that kind of stuff. And so you've seen more mock scrape stuff than you, than you should have probably <laughs> or wanted to. Which you, is all you right. Had, you had to be really bored. Whenever you're, whenever you're stuck in a hotel with zero interaction or outside exposure, um, you get pretty locked in. So. Well, it, and to talk about that too, just for a second, uh, you know, people think, I mean, there's a lot of sacrifices you have to make as a professional athlete. And one of those, how long was it in between before you saw your wife and kids? Oh, man. Due to so, COVID and playoffs and you, right, bubble, so you guys like are in such a bubble. COVID, yeah, so like between COVID um, and everything. So like usually if if you have a child, you only get three days. And usually they, you know, I mean, a lot of guys will be back in a day or two if you have your kid in the city that you're playing in. But like, for instance, um, we had our daughter at the end of June and then I had to leave July 1st. So I got to see her for only about four or five days. Oh. And then I had yeah. to leave, and then I was gone from July to November without seeing them other than FaceTime. Wow. Yeah. Um, that's, and that was a shortened crazy. season. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that was a shortened season. So, like, in the season, like this year, I left in, fe- in second week of February, and I won't be back until October. So, um, now, they will come down and see me once in a while, but I, I think a, a lot of people don't realize, you know, we're playing every single day. Um, we maybe get one or two off days a month and you're at the field from one o'clock until 11 o'clock at night. Um, and and there's obviously a lot of great things about this line of work, but like anything, you know, things wear on you. Um, and, and there's just a lot of things going on that, um, a lot of people don't see behind closed doors. So it's just certain sacrifices that you have to do. But, but in the end, if you can, if you can crack into the big leagues and make a little living for yourself, it's, uh, it's well worth it in the end. Right. So. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I, it's crazy. I don't know if you get this too, but like when Dylan and I are, I'm on a client trip, it'll be 10 clients in 11 days. And I value that day off drastically because <laughs> the last thing I want to do is talk whitetail. And, oh, uh, but, uh, yeah. but then at the same time, I have friends in the area, acquaintances, and they'll say, hey, you're, you're going to be in uh, Western Michigan uh, for 10 days. You got to stop by for a beer. You got to stop by for dinner. And I'm just hoping to get back to the hotel by nine o'clock so I can actually go to dinner before I go to bed. And then, you know, averaging three hours of driving a day. And, and I don't know if you ever get that. You're in XYZ city and a buddy says, Hey, uh, you stop by, you know, you're, absolutely. Cause, yeah, cause well, you're just like going that, to the, you're only at the, you're only playing for four hours. Yeah. Right. So, well, right. <laughs> yeah. And I always joke with, well, I always joke with people because when we were in the minors coming up, you know, you're young, full energy, full spunk. And when you get to an off day, you're like, let's go rent a pontoon boat, you know, let's go, let's go have a good time, spend the whole day, roast, get a big burn, and then just crash and then wake up and uh, go to the game the next day. Well, when you start getting older and you have a family, responsibilities, and you're, and you're in the big leagues, like, you yeah. don't want to talk to anybody on your off day. <laughs> I know. And the last thing, the last thing you want to talk about is baseball, like, that's, oh, yeah. It, it, but it's funny, like, that's what I say, like, it all relates into other fields, right? Like, with oh, what you're doing, and, 
Yeah. And you're always looking like, when's that next off day? Like I have one coming up in about like seven days and everybody <laughs> can't wait for it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And I, there's on my off day, sometimes, you know, I might spend the morning almost just staring at the wall. I mean, it's like you're, you might have the TV on, you might uh, be answering an email or something. Uh, I talk yeah. to Diane a lot on my off days. Uh, I try to talk to my kids too, if I can track them down. Um, Dylan and I might chat, you know, about work or something, but you know, again, the last thing I want to do is I love whitetail, I love hunting. I mean, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, but yeah, it's you need to. I mean, with kind anything, of it for sure, right? It for sure gets exhausting. It right. it yeah. wears on you. That's why sometimes you need to get away from it, and that's why with baseball, I mean, we're doing it nine months out of the year, so those those uh, those remaining months, I mean, it's like you know shut the shut the engines down recharge oh, the batteries man. like i don't even want to think of baseball Go for the next couple months here so yeah um, you're all working what's on cool your about you is now you're implementing plans that gives us whitetail lovers a job to do every month so, yeah exactly so we, we just, never uh, take a month off we just shot uh march deer chores today um so oh, man in well, it kills it, me when i'm when i'm uh 1200 miles away from my land and i can't do anything so i know for all you <laughs> So for all you uh, hardcore hunters out there following Jeff's uh, plans, just be grateful that you can be at your land doing this stuff because I can't do any of it. <laughs> yeah, and it's crazy to think about that. I mean, it's almost like you might as well be fishing for eight months in Alaska on a boat. I mean, it doesn't really matter if you're down in Florida no. or what, doing what you're doing. But um, kind of the have you ever tried a horizontal scrape, a uh, mock scrape? Uh, no, never tried a horizontal. The, the first thing that I got intrigued with was um, – I forget what they're called, and I, I'm sorry to the people that invented it, but it was the thing that they would like drive into the ground, and it was like a rubbing tree or something with a spring. Yeah, um, yeah. That kind of started like piquing my interest of like, okay, that could be a way that I get more pictures in front of my camera without using bait, because Pennsylvania is a huge like non baiting area. Right. Um, so I'm like, okay, maybe I could use that, but then I. I started diving into a little more and then with COVID being away from the family, I started getting into like YouTube a little more and then that's whenever things kind of surfaced with us and then started learning about the vertical scrapes and then like that was like at the end of, I guess it would have been a year ago and then whenever COVID hit, I went out and put all these vertical scrapes up and I honestly never even looked at a horizontal scrape other than, you know, maybe a random person showing a picture of it. but. Um, yeah. I'm really not even very familiar with them, to be honest with and you. And that's where, um, you know, horizontal scrapes, uh, Buck has to typically go out of his way to go hit. It's typically not right on a trail because it's off to, uh, it's on an edge. Um, even a habitat right. change in the woods. Um, and then you see some of those horizontal scrapes that are on a trail, they get used as a perennial scrape over and over and over again. But then as soon as that breaks, then that scrape is done. And so a vertical scrape, keeps deer away from the edge so it puts it right over the exact trail that you want them to travel on and then at the same time you can maintain that for decades if you want to if it's a good mm -hmm. spot you can replace it and and again you know kind of vertical scrape for those of you that don't know out there and i'm sure dylan's laying over the good b-roll right <laughs> now but uh it's um we're we're putting a, a vine usually five to six feet a grapevine um if you're in northern settings where there's no vines you can use jack pines uh, yep. branches Oaks can make really good licking branches. Um, so a lot of times, whatever a deer is rubbing and scraping under right now, you can use. We find, we like vines because they're a little bit stretchy. Um, they're resilient. Uh, they last uh, for years. And I like putting one single vine because you're putting over that scrape. You're putting about waist high. Fawns can hit it. Does can fought it, hit it. Young bucks, old bucks. And what they're primarily doing is they're leaving their preorbital gland scent on that vine. And really, everyone thinks about a scrape where they've tore up that ground, but they're only tearing up the ground about every five, six, you know, for five, six weeks a exactly. year. The rest of the time, they're walking about and just, Yeah, they're you know, coming putting from their, a long way just to rub their eyes on it and move on. They're not spending right. time there raking it with their feet a lot of times. So. And I look at, like, right. you have two or three in one spot. Yeah. Now you just spread out the amount of scent. Right. They're usually not going to hit all three or mm -hmm. both. So now you're, you're, you're putting a fraction of the amount of scent on each one of those other ones that you have in the area. I've seen people attend in one spot. Yeah. I want one single strong one right over a, a trail because I have a bow stand nearby. Yep. And I typically have a tree already picked out that I can put a trail camera on or that trail camera is already out. And that's, Kevin, what you were showing me. And, and did you put any scent on them or any 
on the ground no, or anything? Absolutely not. I think in all, each each uh, each scrape costed me about maybe ten cents. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I mean anything in the hunting industry that. that uh, these days obviously does not cost 10 cents i mean i just went to home depot got some i don't know it was like green black uh, like, like parachute cord. Cord. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah just super Paracord. simple and i mean even like like hearing you talk i mean in all of your strategies with it the things i noticed um i had a lot more luck with vines over any other like if there were areas where i couldn't find vines i would use like uh like young saplings, like beach brush saplings, or whatever I could get my hands on. And I just felt like maybe either the scent didn't hold as well on those, um, but I just felt like they they liked the vines a lot more. And, but I haven't explored anything with like oak branches or the jack pines or anything like that, but I'm sure they work equally as well. I, th- I um, think the vines, yeah. they're they're pretty porous, so they hold, right. they hold scent really well, and then they're really resilient to breaking, and right. uh, and so that's why I like. I think the vines work really well. Now, some in some northern settings where it's a property full of jack pine, fir, spruce, and and aspen regeneration, then that jack pine is going to be the best one, and you don't need to reintroduce something in the area where there's they're not there, they're not familiar with. Right. Um, so I really like that, and um, but yeah, the scent. I mean, I look at it like if you're putting scent on that licking branch, then right. uh, you could potentially wipe off all that preorbital gland goodness on there, where um, right. the deer go by that they're leaving their their scent on there, and I think that stays for a while. I don't know if they can smell twenty deer or twenty five deer on there. I don't know if it lasts for five days, but it lasts for a while. Right. And uh, there's really yeah. no need to do anything else. And what we notice the first thing those deer bucks do when they go to that mock scrape. They go directly to the vine or the vertical branch. I would say, what do you think the percentage is, Dylan? Because Dylan looks at most oh, of the yeah, footage. I mean, they're than... very rarely are they walking up and smelling the ground first. They're walking straight up, touching the tip right. of their nose on that, taking a big whiff, and then they immediately start rubbing their glands on it, getting their scent on it. Oh, we have. Yeah. We just looked at footage today where we have shed box coming in and hitting mock oh, scrapes yeah. in the snow. Yep. And uh, it's we a have, whole year thing. That's what's beautiful about it. And we have one with Venti. Yep. Yeah, it was just a couple yep. weeks ago. Venti mm-hmm. came in and hit one of the scrapes, Kevin. It was pretty cool. Just so just cool. a couple yeah. weeks ago, and it was right plain as day, beautiful, right in front of the screen. Oh, yeah. And so, and that was right on a mock scrape, of course, too. But um, hey, Kevin, do yeah. you have do you have any other questions about mock scrapes or anything? I know your time is valuable. You got you got probably <laughs> BP oh, or something I, to do. So <laughs> I have all the evenings off now. So nice. this is my hangout time. Nice, <laughs> nice. Um, That's good. And you guys are getting my fix talking about white tail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll have to do it again sometime too. No, like I said, yeah. uh, maybe we'll get one of, the, one of the other guys uh, with you on a, on a call too. And, uh, but um, as for, I would say, so I, on my property alone, I don't know if acres matter, but I probably had, uh, oh gosh, I probably maybe had seven or eight vines out on a 180 acre piece. And um, it's crazy. There was only about one of, no. Uh, one that stayed consistent still up until today um Mm. and all those other ones i I learned a lot of valuable lessons on them one was next to a apple tree where we knew like a natural scrape was that they didn't care about the vertical vine they they wanted to go to that perennial natural scrape which was the biggest hotbed on this on the last two weeks of october i mean every single buck i feel like within two mile radius hit that scrape yeah those apple tree scrapes are incredible Mm -hmm. oh my gosh so like but once that branch broke they were gone so oh yeah that was an issue and then um try hanging a try hanging a vertical right down through the branches of the apple tree yeah so that's what i'm gonna that's what i'm gonna try to get done for this year because that i mean that was a wicked hot spot and then another one it wasn't on flat terrain it was on kind of um, like a side hill yeah. that that they hit a little bit just passing through, but it wasn't like one that I was getting consistent activity on. So, right. um, and I think you you talked about that in one of the videos that, that yeah. you should. I mean, a lot with the water holes. Obviously, you don't want to put those into a hill. But there was that um, the species we already talked about. But the one that has just created the most traffic was in like at the bottom of like a. I don't really want to call it a ravine, but um, but it was in like the bottom of this draw that was perfectly flat, um, had plenty of cover around it, and I mean a very hard place to access. But yeah. 
Um, uh-huh. It was just one of those things that, like, exactly what you were saying, Dylan, like, these bucks would just walk right to this thing with their nose in the air. Mm-hmm. And there are probably a lot of the videos I, I, I would share with you because it was just amazing. Yeah. Um, and they're yep. still hitting it today, awesome. um, which is really cool. But my problem is I didn't think about access to get to this thing before I did it. So it's more of, like, an internal, like, sanctuary area that I'm never going to touch because it's because I would just blow everything out of there getting to it. But then there was another really good one that I had bucks, I mean, hammering it. It was a perfect bench along like a semi-hilly terrain. And I mean, from June to September, I mean, all my velvet bucks were hitting it constantly. Then as soon as all the foliage fell and the fall came, nothing. I mean, I'm talking from October, November, and, and I pulled the camera in December because, I mean, nothing came by it anymore because everything fell. Obviously, fall, fall, fall cover's a big one if you want to keep them around in fall, but also it's got to be flat. they got to be comfortable. And I, So those are the three, three biggest takeaways that I pulled from it this year, and obviously staying out of there, not to spook it. But, right. Well, um, I know you, you started working on your land late, too, and so you might really end up with 12 right. or 14 you know, tree stands this year, or 15 or what, and I encourage one at every every stand location, too. And I, we're, uh, we'll... Uh, wrap this up i know you have stuff to do and uh and we're gonna yeah. we're gonna change batteries here and, talk, and get going <laughs> and uh we still have i think we've shot five videos today we're gonna shoot two more maybe you mm-hmm. know one or two more and then sure. dylan will get back on the road but uh super cool we uh yeah so yeah, I mean, kevin great it's talking all evolving. <laughs> yeah it is it is and uh um we'll i'll i'll uh keep track of you during spring training here and i know we'll we'll talk again and I appreciate Absolutely. you spending your downtime with me. That's cool. So, yeah, yeah, great chat. Always with enjoy. You. Yeah. Absolutely, guys. Yeah, tell I'm looking forward to meeting you. Definitely. And obviously, Jeff, in person, I feel like we have this like virtual like friendship. <laughs> I know. Which is, like what like COVID's doing to everybody. Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> it is. I know. Kind of like when you think about you not seeing your family for five months, it kind of put puts things in perspective. It's uh, yeah, it's been Absolutely. crazy, but uh, we are both blessed and Dylan too to do Absolutely. what we do. Yeah. And uh, and so you go out and hit some balls and uh, and uh, look, for, look look forward to you staying healthy and having a great spring training yeah, and, fun. and uh, hopefully making it all the way again this year. So great chat with you, yeah. Kevin. Really appreciate Thank the question and, and the time. It. I'll be talking to you guys soon here. Yeah, sounds right. good. Sounds good. Now as we transition into habitat season, I hope you've had a chance to check out my web class, how to design your web your whitetail parcel. It's on my website, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I have a link in the description. And I hope you can find it, check it out, and enjoy it this year.